I have a long, a long text today, and it's all on one story, even Moses' encounter with a God he'd never met, a God he did not know, but a God he was about to have a powerful encounter with. Our encounters with God, they reveal who God is, because our encounters with God can reveal, he re, can reveal himself by having an encounter where he heals us. And we know at that moment, he's a God who heals. We say, how do I know God heals because he heals me? We're going to have an encounter with God and we come to know who he is and we cry out to him and say, be my savior. I know God is a savior because he saved me. We're going to have an encounter with God. There are testimonies that go back to the 1930s and 40s and on where, where people could walk into a little, little tiny church like a, a Pentecostal church on the other side of town in the 19 late 40s and when they started in 1948 and through the 50s, where you could walk into, you know, people walk into that church out of the blue. People walk in drunk out of their mind, walk out stone sober. And you say, I had an encounter with God and he sobered me up, he delivered me. And those are the encounters we come, we come to know God. But you know, sometimes we have an encounter and we get to know God in that encounter. And God reveals things about us that we didn't know about ourselves. And, and sometimes they, they can, they can outright scare us. Sometimes an encounter with God can turn things around in our life for the good. And sometimes even as God is turning things around in our life for our good, there are things about ourselves that get revealed that, that scare us to death and make us react. Like we're going to read here in Exodus 3 and Exodus 4, where, where in this case, there is something about Moses that gets revealed that gets God's ire up. It's one of the very few times where, where you, you see God. It says about God. Now, there's a lot of places in Scripture where it talks about God was angry. But this is one of the very few times you will see in Scripture where it says, and God burned with anger. There, there's being angry. And then there's burning in anger. And he's burning in anger, not about the Hebrews that he's going to bring out of Egypt. He's burning in anger and not about the Egyptians that are have a have a, a yoke around the Hebrews' neck in, in slavery, he's not not burning in anger about them. He's not burning in anger as we would read through the Exodus about all the ites that are out in the desert that the Hebrews will encounter. He's burning in anger about the leader who will lead them out. In that moment, God is burning with anger with Moses. But the reason why he burns with anger with Moses is because in that calling where God calls Moses, he raises him up, calls him out, calls him to, and something happens in that calling that just gets God's ire up. Sometimes encounters with God, they'll stir us up for such great things that God will call us to do. And sometimes in that calling and in that raising up, that, that encounter with God begins to re, re, reveal things in our flesh, reveal things in our spirit, reveal things that are yet hidden, that, that come to focus if nothing else in our own life. We become aware of it. And sometimes we make it known around us and people become aware of it. And that encounter is what we're going to look at today. But not just about the fact that God's anger burns. We're going to look at what, what happens in Moses that brings that out. Because what happens in Moses happens in probably every single one of us at some, at some point in our life. I wonder, have any of you, would any of you admit that, <laughs> that you've ever suffered with at one time or another and I'm not asking you to raise a hand because you might be suffering it from it this morning. Have you, have you ever suffered from a low self-esteem? 
that you have looked at your life and said, I'm a nobody, I can't do anything, why, don't call on me. When you were in school, I have hands go up. When you were in school and, you, and the teacher is starting to ask questions, you say, please don't call my name. Because I had fun all weekend, I didn't do my homework, and I don't know the answer. Or even worse, I read my books, I did all my homework, and I still don't know the answer. I was both. <laughs> I could study all week and still don't know what I'm talking about. There are times in our life when we can be so low in our confidence and have such a low self-esteem that it impacts how we live in this life. It impacts our encounters with people. It impacts our, our marriages. It impacts our jobs. It impacts our kids. It impacts, if you're a kid, it impacts your parents. Low self-esteem has such a negative impact on our life all the way across the board. And God has an answer for that low self-esteem. Let me repeat that. God has an answer for, it, for the struggle of low self-esteem. And that answer is, and I made it as a sermon title, developing a godly self-image. And starting next week, I'm going to be dealing with some messages on leadership. We have some young people growing up, and I'm hoping you're all going to be here. Because there are some, there are some great things out there for developing godly leadership. And we're going, to be, we're going to be dealing with Moses next week. A little bit of Moses last week, a little bit of Moses this week, a little bit of Moses next week. Moses the man, now Moses the leader. So let me read these two texts that I have in Exodus 3 and Exodus 4. Exodus 3, 1 through 15 says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, you want to know how I know God knows you? How I know that he knows your name? The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, well, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, 
The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. And then in Exodus 4, there's a lot of things that happen in between. In Exodus 4, 1 through 17, this conversation picks up again. Moses answered. Poor Moses with his questions. What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake. And he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out, took a hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak. And when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak. And when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, may they believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses said, after all this, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue, but God's got an answer. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. After all of that, Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. In plain English, sorry, Lord, no. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And he said, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so that you can perform the sign with it. Oh, dear Lord, would you help us with your word? Let it apply to our hearts and our lives, I pray in the name of Jesus. Oh, I pray in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Encounters with God, they are incredible. We always pray for an encounter with God. On Saturday nights when we pray, we're always praying, aren't we? We're praying for a move of God. We're praying for a revival. We're praying for a stirring. But I want you to understand, you know, I, and sometimes I think this. I don't always say it, but I think this sometimes. Be careful what you pray for. You just might get it. Because if there's a stirring that God's going to do in the church, that stirring is not going to begin with a line of people trying to get into the door. If there's going to be a stirring in the church, he is going to be stirring the people who are here. He is going to be working in our hearts and our lives. He is going to be waking us up from our sleepy patterns. He is going to be getting us up out of our, our, our normal places, our normal things that we do, and say to us, I'm waking you up. I'm stirring your heart. I'm getting a hold of you. And in God doing that, there are things that are going to come to the surface in our lives that have been asleep because we've been content and comfortable. And we won't recognize it until it starts to happen. And we say, where did that come from? And 
we have to be careful when God stirs our hearts. We pray for an encounter. We better be ready for God to do that encounter. Moses, Moses didn't even know God. Moses wasn't even looking for God. God was looking for him. Just remember this about this servant Moses. That when Moses was born, his mother was in Egypt. And when he was born, Pharaoh had ordered all the baby boys to be slaughtered. And Moses, you know the story. I know Dixie knows it because she's been teaching it to the kids for years. Teaching the kids to sing Jesus, in, I mean, Moses in the bulrush, in the little basket hidden in the reeds. We, we teach that story to three- and four-year-olds. The call on Moses' life began, I tell you, in the womb of his mother. The call on Moses' life began when, when Moses was still an infant. And was, and was placed in a basket to protect him against a, 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 a sea of people seeking to destroy another group. Moses was hidden in a basket to protect him. Why? Because God had a call on Moses' life. He was protecting Moses because even then he knew Moses one day is going to be the deliverer for your people. So hide him. And God is, I, I love that story because God has such a, I don't know, sense of humor. You know, and I don't know if you can always see this. It's humorous, putting a baby in a basket and putting it in the reeds along a river where there are alligators. I don't know. I wouldn't put my baby in a basket in a river where there are alligators. But what do I know? God said, do it. They did it. Today, you just get sued for it. I, I'm kidding, but not. But here, God is protecting this baby. And, and a woman from the Egyptian life, a woman from, the, from the, the Pharaoh's home, the Pharaoh's entourage, she sees this baby, she hears the crying, grabs the basket, sees this baby, we found a baby, and here's someone who's been praying to their gods for a baby, and they haven't been getting a baby, and it's like, the gods gave me a baby out of the river. And they see this baby and they say, we have to go find a servant. To see the, is go find a servant that is, that, that is in a place where she can nurse this baby. And nearby, guess what? There's the baby's mom. And so the mom is brought into Pharaoh's house to become the nursemaid for her own baby. And it says, if you go read that text, it says they paid her. They paid her to nurse her own. You talk about God having his plans down. God has good plans. He knows what he's doing. And I give you that background because that takes you all the way to here where Moses is 80 years old and has been through a lot. He spent like 40 years out there with, in, with the Midianites getting married and having kids, the first one being Gershwin. Gershon. Gershwin is the guy who writes the piano music. Gershon. All these years later, now as a shepherd out in the wilderness, he finally has an encounter with the God who saved him 80 years earlier. And God has to tell him who he is. And it's a dramatic... Anybody here ever have a burning bush experience? Anybody here want to have a burning bush experience? Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? Not if it reveals things in your life you didn't know were there. <laughs> but maybe you want those things revealed so that you can become a better follower of Christ. Amen. Come on. So God calls him. and We have this encounter in these 32 verses. And, and God says, this is what I want you to do. I've called you. And I want you to go and take my people. God, who knows everything, who can look at Moses and says, I know my people. And I know my people are suffering. I know who they are, where they are, and I know who's making them suffer. I know all of their story. I have got them. I hear them. My ears hear them. My eyes see them. My heart goes out for them. This is a God who says, I can hear, I can see, I can feel, I can sense, and I want them saved. 
how much more do we have a God today who can look at our world and say, I can see them, I can hear them, I can feel them. And he looks at the church and he says, church, be Moses and go out to your world. You go out, let me encounter you so you can encounter them, so you can reach them for me because my eyes see them, my ears hear them, my heart just rips for them. Go! Moses is sent to a people group that is his own. And God is sending us to the world. And sometimes, you know, when we've been in the church too long, and we hear the whole, whole sermons about sending and go, and you say, who can do that? And where are we going to get the money? And we want to just kind of sit back and come up and calculate everything. And God says, I didn't call you to calculate. I called you to send you. At what point do you go by faith? At what point do those around you rise up and say, don't worry, go. We'll do the calculating. Go, oh, come on, it's got to be. That's what our missionaries do. Our missionaries just walk around, from, or they travel from church to church. They share their vision. They share God's call in their life. And they go by faith, and we're the ones doing the calculating. You know, the districts, and the sum of God says, well, this is what it's going to take to live in that part of the world. You know, you, you, you share your vision, you share your story, you raise your budget, by faith you're going. And they, they, by faith, that's all they can see. And it's the church that calculates. And it's the church that sends them. Don't worry, go. We got you. If we have to give up a steak once a month, we got you. Oh, boy. Amen, Pastor. Come on, I just, come on. Moses here in this storyline, he, this encounter with God, Moses raises objections. But, 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 but. First, Moses says, who am I? Who am I that I should be the one to go? You know, God, Moses didn't go looking for God. God came looking for Moses. So God's the one with the plan. And if God is the one with the plan, doesn't God know Moses enough that if he wants Moses to go, then Moses should go? Does God know what he's talking about? Do you believe God knows what he's talking about? Yeah. Do you believe God knows you and God knows the church and God knows us enough to know that if he calls us to do something for him and in his name, that he obviously knows what he's talking about? Right. You know, I remember when I was Nino's age, and, and telling people that I knew that God was calling me in the ministry. I tell you, there were plenty of people who said to me, did God really say? And you just want to shake your head and say, but God told me. Yeah, I look back at that and realize that at 17 years old, and having a dream, I had a dream of this very church, never even knowing that this church ever existed. And God gave me a dream of this exact building with this exact design, with that exact handicap ramp going down the back of the building. God gave me a dream of this exact place and said, that's, that's you. I knew exactly where I would be when I would one day be in ministry. Had no idea I was walking up to the building in October of 1990. Because in my dream, the building was white, and I got here, and it was red. Somebody messed up with God's plan, went and painted the church red just to try to confuse me. No, just kidding. They had their reasons. But God knew. God knew what he was doing calling Moses. Who am I? Why should I go? Second, he says, who should I say sent me? I don't even know you, God. How do I go there and tell them when I don't even know you? Isn't it amazing that God can have a call in your life and you don't know God enough to know that you can tell somebody God's plan for your life? It should say something. It should begin to reveal something about who we are. It should begin to reveal our character and, and our understanding. You can see Moses' self-esteem is dropping as he asks these questions. Third, he says, well, wh wh what if they don't believe me? Okay, God's got an answer for everything. It's like a kid. When you want to tell them to do something, the kid's got an answer for everything. We don't like it when it comes from the kid, but I hope we like it when it comes from God. What if they don't believe me? And then there's a fourth one that says, Moses looks at his, his problem with stuttering, and he says, I don't have the gifts to do this. I, I don't have the ability to do this. I, I can't do this, God. And God says to him in this text, 
I'll teach you how to speak. And I will show you what to say. How much more does God have to convince a person who is second-guessing his calling when God has to say to them repeatedly, but I got you, I've got you, I've got you. Christian, do we sometimes struggle in our faith? Do we sometimes struggle in our walk because we second-guess things and we second-guess God? We second-guess our decisions. We second-guess our commitments. We second-guess, did, did God say, did God say, did God say, did God say? And God is trying to speak to our heart and said, would you please just listen to me? I am speaking to you. Yeah. Moses is having a problem. And many of us have similar responses that Moses had. When called upon to take on a ministry, to volunteer, whether it's in the church or volunteer even in your own home with your own family, to do some family project, to, you know, when we're called upon, to, does our self-doubt rise up when we're called and someone says, I need your help, and we, uh, we they immediately think, I, I can't do that. I, I can't do that. Why are they always asking me? I, no, don't ask me. You know, sometimes if your family's asking you, it's because they have confidence in you. Maybe they're looking for some free help, um, but maybe they have confidence in you. If God's calling you and speaking to your heart to do something, maybe God has confidence in you. Would God ask you to do something that he didn't think you could do? Would he? If you're working for a boss and your boss asks you to do a job, is, do, you, do you really think that your boss thinks you can do that job? Would they ask you if they didn't think you could do it? They're asking you because they believe you can do it. They have more hope in you and they have more, 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 I, you know, they, they, they have more confidence in you than maybe sometimes you have in yourself. And God has a lot more confidence in you than sometimes you have in yourself. But for Moses, God has an answer for his doubts and abilities. God says, first, I will be with you. To prove it, I give you my first sign. He says, I will show you how much I am with you. When you get my people out, you're going to come right back to this. this is the place he's talking about is Mount Horeb. It's considered a holy mountain, and it's a place that you would come and worship. And he's telling Moses, when you get my people out, you're coming back here. When you come back here, you're going to worship me, and I'm going to meet you right here. See, he says there, that was his first. That was his first sign to Moses when Moses says, "I don't know if I can do this." God says, "Yes, you can," and you're going to bring them right here, and we're all going to have a meeting. Second, he says, "I am who I am. I am that I am." He says, "I will give you my name. I'll tell you how I'm called." I tell you how you will reference me. I tell you how they are to reference me. I am that I am. I don't have names like all those gods in Egypt. No man puts a name on me. We don't put names on God. He is God. Third, he says, I will give you signs. You know, sometimes as people, we just want signs for everything. What did they tell Jesus? Every time Jesus tried to say he was the son of God, every time he tried to say, I'm from the Father, what did, what did they do? Show us a sign, Jesus. I mean, how many dead people did he have to rise, from, uh, rise up? How many sick people did he have to rise up off their mat? How many blind people, or deaf people had to be healed? How many thousands of people had to be fed from a little boy's lunch? That he can walk on water out there in the middle of a, of a sea. What do you have to do for a sign to show people you are who you are? And even though his, his reputation goes before him and everybody is talking about the things they've seen, what do the religious leaders still ask? Show me a sign. Show me a sign. And God is saying to Moses, Moses isn't asking for a sign. He just says, I'll give you a sign. And here's this list. You already heard it. 
Take your rod, Moses, and throw it on the ground. It'll become a snake. Now pick it up. It becomes a rod again. Now, that doesn't happen once. It happens twice, doesn't it? Because when, when does that happen a second time? When Moses answers the call and goes before Pharaoh, and, Mo, and, Meryl, and Moses says, watch this. He puts his, his stake on the ground. It turns to a snake. And others say, oh, we could do that too. And they, uh, they put their, their rods down. Now we've got three snakes. The movie's doing really good. And suddenly one snake eats up the others. Just so you know, God is God. And, and these, these happen again. Um, and not the leprosy, but other things happen, including death, where God shows signs not to Moses, but to Pharaoh. But some of these are repeated. The snake is repeated, and the Nile turned to blood is repeated. But that must have been interesting for Moses to pull his hand out and say, yikes! And then when, when Miriam gets in trouble, Moses can say, yeah, I've been there, baby. <laughs> Sorry, dear. Let's see if we can fix this. Moses becomes leprous, leprous, and then God heals him. Then the water turning to blood from the Nile. God reminds Moses that man gets their abilities from him. That's the fourth one. When Moses says, I can't do it. When Moses says, I can't do it. When you, when you look at God and you say, God, I can't do what you want me to do. I, I don't have the ability to do it. And, and God will look at you and say, where do you think your abilities come from? Where, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. When young people are called into ministry and they start questioning your, their abilities, if you're questioning your abilities, God's going to set you back and he's going to talk to you and say, where do you think your abilities are coming from? Your ability to preach, your ability to teach, your ability to minister, your ability to sing, your ability to go out and reach the lost. Where do you think that comes from? It doesn't come from you. You didn't get that training in a Bible school. The Bible school was given undergirding you with the word. The gifts don't come from the Bible school. The gifts come from God. I didn't go to North Central to find some gifts. I went to North Central because I wanted to be girded in the word of God. I wanted to answer the call. And they trained me in the word of God. The gifts I have didn't come from them. The gifts I have came from God. And God reminds Moses here, your gifts come from me. If I'm sending you to call them out, I will give you the gifts. And he says, I will, I will help you both and to speak and to say, I give you both. So imagine the excuses Moses keeps giving God. Imagine, church, the excuses sometimes we give God. And God keeps trying to show us that he's there. And he knows us. And then that final one. That final conversation that tries God's patience. That final answer in chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, when, when Moses says, Lord, please, just send someone else. Like I told you in my opening, there are only a few times you will find this phrase, this wording in the scriptures, where it says, the Lord's anger burned. You will find lots of references that God has anger. But this one is so specific. His anger burns. It doesn't burn against a people. It burns against a person. It doesn't burn against an enemy of God. It's burning against one whom God has called. It's burning against somebody who has been invited to that meeting. Moses has been invited to that meeting. He's at that burning bush because God put that bush on fire. It's an encounter that would get Moses' attention. And when Moses came near that bush, God said, okay, you're here. Come on, let's have a conversation. God drew him in. <laughs> Good word to use because it's a burning bush. The bush is burning, and now I'm burning. 
Moses, how could you do this? How could you please say that you want someone else? But, but you know, it's interesting. God really, wants, God really wants Moses to do this. God really wants Moses to do this. God has been prepping him since for 80 years. 80 years, Edwin. Can you imagine being prepped for 80 years for a job? That's a long time to be trained for a job that you're probably only going to do. Well, he only did it for one generation. 80 years to do a 40-year job. God's answer. It's another telltale sign that God knows you. It's another telltale sign that God's not missing anything on this earth. God doesn't miss anything, church. Those of you online, God doesn't miss a thing. Don't ever feel like God has abandoned you and left you and doesn't know you and doesn't understand what you're going through and doesn't have a clue what you're going through in life because I'm telling you, God knows you. Because what does God say to Moses when Moses says no? He's mad at him, but then he turns and says, your brother Aaron is already on his way to see you. He not only knows that Moses has a brother named Aaron, but he knows that Aaron is in a journey to where Moses is. Aaron's coming to Moses. Where's Moses? Out there in the middle of the, of the desert, kind of, out there by Mount Horeb, out there with the Midianites taking care of his father-in-law Jethro's sheep. And Aaron's coming to meet Moses. And God says, your brother's already on his way. He's coming to meet with you. So this is what I'm going to do, Moses. You're not getting out of this call. But I will give you help. Your brother will be with you when you talk to me. And what I tell you, you're going to, con you're going to convey to him. Aaron's going to be your mouthpiece. He's going to be your speaker. And everything I teach you, you teach him. And when he speaks, it, he will be like a contemporizer. He will be a megaphone for me. And you, you will be God, rep, you will be a representative of God before him and before my people. That's exactly what that word says. You will be me. When he says you will be me, he, he literally means you will represent me. He's going to represent you, and you're going to represent me. So you're going to stand before me, and you're going to come in my presence, and I'm going to teach you. You're going to go out and teach your subordinates, and they are going to convey it before God. That happens today in ministry all the time. You want to know? Just talk to, Matt, just, just talk to Antonino. When he goes off to the DR and works with Mateus, Mateus hears from God and what they're going to do over there in the DR, and Mateus turns around and tells Antonino, this is what you're going to do. God told me to do this, 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 this. I'll get out there and do it. You become Aaron. You didn't know that, did you? You're, you're Aaron. Now you know. You, somebody has a, a direction, and he hears from God and says, now you go do it. <laughs> I want you to be my Aaron for a while. Let me hear from God and tell you what to do. Amen. All right. <laughs> that sounded good. That felt good to say that. I don't know if it's ever going to happen, but it felt good to say it. He, he's good. He helps me. I asked him for help. Nino was right there on the spot. Marco was right there on the spot. And Moses, when these guys are incredible, they come and say, whatever you want, Pastor. I haven't asked them for a million dollars in a car of spending money because their father can't find that yet. So according to this text, Moses adds insult to injury by telling God no. But God, looking at the circumstances, says in his anger, I'm still going to enable you. I'm still going to tell you what to say and how to say it. And you and your brother are going to lead my people out. And you go and you read that story, you know what Moses does. Moses and Aaron go back and they, they meet the Pharaoh. And they tell the Pharaoh everything that God told them. And Pharaoh does everything that Moses knew the Pharaoh would do. And Moses showed them all the signs that God told him to show. The one that you don't see and hear, a sign, 
And, and it would have been terrifying. I can understand why God would wait till the end to do it. Would be, he did not tell Moses in advance that he was going to kill the firstborn in Egypt. That would come later with the blood on the doorpost so that all those in Goshen would be spared. But I want to leave you with this verse. It's in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. It's the only verse that I chose out of the text that I gave you today because it's the one verse that I think fits you and me as the church even more over than, than everything else that you can look at. This, this text, this is our text. This is, this is our mantra. This is what we run with for our walk in faith in Christ. When In Philippians, where Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That is something that ought to be on a, on a placard in your, in your room. It ought to be on a banner on your wall. It ought to be on a little banner on the, on, on the front of your car, right there on, on the dash of your car. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. When you say, I can't do this, you got to stop yourself and say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I don't know if I can witness to that person, but I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I don't know if I can help that person who's homeless. I don't want to get involved in their life, but I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I don't know if I can teach kids, but I can do all things through Christ. I don't know if I can get up there and sing a song, but I can do all things through Christ. I don't know if I can go out and help and do ministry, whether it's with my family or with my church, but I can do all things through Christ. Wow. We've got to stop talking about and thinking about what we cannot do. We've got to stop letting our self-esteem take us down and take us down to a place where we are afraid. God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. We have to go through not in, not in fear, but in trust and power and, and confidence. Be confident of this very thing, that he who started working you will keep doing it until Jesus Christ comes back. We have Christ. I said I had one verse and went and quoted three more. That's okay. It's the word of God. You and I, oh man, we've got a God who loves us. We've got a God who loves us. And it's called us according to his purpose. We've got a God that if he speaks to our heart about something, he's not just guessing. He's, he's calling us because he knows us. God's calling, I believe, all three Marino brothers because he knows them. And I'm sorry, but Moses, you're just going to have to get a second job. <laughs> I said I said it's on your cheek because you guys are going to be adults. He is going to tell you to go find your own resources, and I'm just going to pray for you. <laughs> but I do believe that God has His hand on all, and I do, I believe God has His hand on on uh, Bella's life. But then I believe that God has His hand on every single person that's in this church. They may be some of them may be called to do specific ministry. But I believe that every single one of us are called. Yeah. I, I, I believe, I believe, I just believe that every, every young person you represented in this room, your kids, I believe there's a calling on their life. And maybe one day, if they're not walking with the Lord, one day they may, they may wake up. Are you hearing me? Yeah. One day they, God may get, speak to them. Who knows what God's call might be on Camilla's life? Right? You know, or um, Alexa, or Joe, Joy, or Lucky. I don't know why I say Joe, and it's right here, Joy. Or, or Lucky, or Serenity, or Adia, or Journey, or Adelina. And the list is going to get longer in another couple of months. There's another, another one or two names going to be added to this list in a couple of months. In fact, the one should already be added to this. What is, what is Adelina's brother's name? Micah. Make sure you got to keep up with this next generation that's being born. 
start praying for them because, you know, even though I may not always remember the kids' names and I put it up here so that I'll remember their names and not be embarrassed when I can't mention their names um, and I'm not going to, you know, but it also gives me a, 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 a list of names of our children that I can keep praying for because as long as there are children, I'm going to pray for them and trust God for their very lives and I don't know what God may have for them. Uh, we already see, we already we already know the Marino kids and and Bella are, want to be involved in ministry, and now we see Praveen's boys wanting to be involved in ministry, and um, we encourage that. We will always encourage that. We encourage that. We encourage that with Jordan and Mike, and and um, with um, Kyle, even with his sisters. We. When, when people grow up in the church, we, we want to see them involved because we don't know what God may be calling them to. We, want, we don't want any of our kids to sit in this church and have to sit in a pew and feel like they don't matter and they don't count. They count as much as anybody else. They mean as much to me as any adult sitting in this church. I don't want our kids to be seen and not heard. I want them to be able to express and and seek, and I want them to be able to question, request, question reverently, you know, but, um, but I want them to be able to question. I want them to think. And I want them to experiment with what they might want to do in ministry. I want them to try to sing and find out, well, maybe it's not for me. Maybe they'll find something else. How will they know if they don't ask and seek and take that chance? Because God knows them. Oh, God knows them. And even though I don't always remember their names, God has their name, their first name and their last name. God knows exactly where they live. He already has their address. He knows them. Intimately knows them. And he knows you. Remember that when you call on God about the needs in your life. God knows them before you ever ask them, but he wants you to ask. I end with this, parent, mom, dad, how often do you already know what your kids are going to ask you, but you wait for them to ask you anyways? Right? Am I right or am I right? You, you want them to ask anyways. And you may have a hundred different reasons why you want them to ask, but you're the parent and you want them to ask. God already, the Bible says God knows what we have need of before we ever ask him. So why does he ask us to ask? Because we have our trust in him. We have faith in him. We look to him. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. What kind of a relationship would we have with God if, if we never spoke to him, we never asked him, we never trusted in him, and he just kept pouring out everything that he knew we needed before we ever asked it. We, you know what happens with that. He's a sugar daddy. You know what happens in a relationship with a sugar daddy? There is none. And it's a spoiled child that doesn't have any appreciation. You don't want your child to get like that. So you want your child to ask. You want to have a conversation with your child. And there are things they're going to ask for that you're going to say, Whoa, you're only 11 years old. You're not taking the car today. You know they're not taking the car. They're go- it won't stop them from asking you if they have enough guts. <laughs> but there are things that you're not going to give them because you know they're not ready for. When they want their allowance raised to $100 a week, they're going to look at them and say, listen, kid, I'm working 80 hours a week and I don't get $100 of spending money. Forget about it. You get your dollar fifty, and that's it. Oh, I heard that. Quarter. <laughs> you get a roof over your head and three squares. <laughs> there, there are things that they will ask you that they that you know they're not ready for. They will ask you things that you know is not right for them. And as a parent, you have to look out for what is this, what is their best interest. How much more does your heavenly father love you and knows what you have need of and will give you not what you think you want, but what you really need in your life. 
And he will want to pour into your life, not to ruin your life or make your life miserable, but to help you and, in, and in, to help you endure and overcome and build a relationship with him. We have a heavenly father. Now, Satan, yeah, he'll just keep throwing garbage at you, hoping for something will stick and trap you. He has no idea, has no interest in your welfare. But God, his only interest is your welfare. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Lord, would you help us? Lord, would you help us? We, we pray for, we, we long for an encounter with you. We know you, and we can call you by name. And Lord, we know that you know us. Lord, we pray. We pray on Saturday nights. We, we pray throughout the week. We, we're looking for and longing for something more. We want to walk in a deeper relationship, a more intimate relationship with you. We want to know you. We want to know you deeper. But, Lord, sometimes we know that in walking closer to you, there is a revealing a little bit more of who we are. And you aren't revealing because you're trying to hurt us or hinder us. You're allowing things to be revealed because you want us to, to come closer to you and the things that are hindering us, the things that are hurting us, you're revealing them so that we can recognize them and remove them. And if we feel overwhelmed by them, then we know how to ask for you to help us, Lord, to remove those things from our life. You may not be calling us to be a Moses and rise up to another country and free another country from its bondage. But you have called us, Lord, to rise up and be a people who testifies to who you are, to a world who has plenty of bondage in their lives. Not from a tyranny of a government, from a, but from a tyranny of, of Satan who wants to take them all down with him. Oh, would you help us, Lord? Oh, please, would you help us? that we would not make excuses when you speak to us. That we would not say no and look the other way, but Lord, we would just call upon your name when we have that sense and say, God, okay, I will do what you want me to do, but I need your help. Would you help us, Lord? Oh, I pray in Christ's name. Oh, in Christ's name. Help us, Lord, that we can see our uh, our our self-image, Lord, that if we would have our confidence of a rise, our self-image, but be, be framed by God instead of framed by this world. I pray in Christ's name. And everyone said, Amen. Oh, amen and amen.